Hey everyone, welcome back to All The Mod 7 To The Sky. We're joined by some more Drigmies here. We started Batania last episode and we automated the Pure Daisies, the Petal Apothecary, and we set up a farm here for the Jaded Amaranthus. Here it comes. Any second. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. That never gets old. So yeah, this can give us the flowers, which we craft into petals and then again into dye. We established the last episode that our plan was to use hostile neural networks to generate wool and we're going to use the dye over there from Batania to automate the Spectrolus. And the Spectrolus is going to give us a huge amount of mana if we can manage to automate it properly. So the plan for today is to continue our adventures through Batania. We still got quite a bit to automate. We need to trade with the elves and set up our Spectrolus of course. With the ultimate goal of being able to get these two runes part of the ATM star. However, we may switch up later in the video and focus on some more tech. We have some uh, some fixes to make with our sim setups over there. Oh yeah, and quick upgrade in the beginning here, we can add a messenger lens to this thing. It should help reduce the mana cost for the Drum of the Wild. Oh, I love this thing. <laughs> so yeah, first quest for today is to turn these dyes and craft it together with wool to give us all 16 different colours. And that is going to happen on this wall here. So the next thing that we have to do here is trade with the elves. And to be able to do that, we have to unlock Terra Steel. Terra Steel is made with the terrestrial agglomeration plate, and this requires a handful of the tier one runes. I believe this is every tier one rune. First is gonna be the rune of mana. Speaking of mana, I really, really hope we have enough for this. This is a very costly process, the agglomeration plate. Next is the rune of air. The plan is definitely to automate this rune of color, but I'm gonna wait until we have a solid source of mana first. So for now, we're just going to batch craft and do this manually. Anyways, next one is the Severn of Earth, I believe. And Fire and Water, the other two for the agglomeration plate we crafted last episode. We should have a few spare. Yeah, there we go. We got it crafted. This is probably a quest somewhere. We should maybe pay attention to this. Oh, it wants us to make the spark for some reason. We can make a spark. We'll make a recipe for it, even. We'll be making heavy use of these whenever we are transporting large amounts of mana. Yep, there's the double quest. So the way this plate works is it's a small multi-block structure actually. We have four lapis blocks and five blocks of living rock. I think something like this and we put the agglomeration plate in the middle. We give it items and also mana. We can do that with the spark actually. And what we want to make of course is terra steel. We can make some pretty decent armor from this. In fact, we may even invest in this because right now we're rocking the diamond set. Unenchanted I might add. <laughs> and our tools are absolutely garbage as well. We should look at some tool upgrades. We did get this actually from the, the wandering trader. But yeah, Terra Steel is going to be a Mana Pearl, Mana Diamond, and a Mana Steel. Mmm, looks like it doesn't work with just the one spark. I think we might have to- yeah, there we go. Did we run out of mana? We run out of mana. This is- yeah, this is a very expensive process, and we wanted to craft within five minutes, else this thing will despawn, and it will consume all the mana we've just given it. So how can we potentially speed this up? Is this one going to be in range, I wonder? Please tell me this is going to finish. I think we run out of mana again. Uh-oh. Okay, I wonder if these pools over here are in range. I somehow doubt it. We can try. Ah, it worked! We got our first Terra Steel. I think we actually need two though to get this up and running. And that was like hours of mana we just used <laughs> from the End of Flames. On a slightly more positive note, I did manage to filter in all of the wool blocks and we got a crafter for each one. We're actually pulling the items from Applied Energistics. We have two interfaces here supplying the, d the various different dyes and also white wool which itself is also being buffered in the first drawer. And I made sure to put it in the order that the Spectrolus will ask for the items in. A few of you guys also suggested including them in these crafters here. And there's this very specific reason why I wanted to separate them, which will become clear later this episode. Oh yeah, I guess we can also storage bust this controller to get access to the excess wool. Wait a second, we need three nuggets for the gateway core, we need one core. And how many for the pylons? Is it three each? And we need two pylons, so that's a total of nine nuggets. We get nine nuggets per ingot. Wait a second. Yeah, I think we might be able to. There's two pylons. We need three glimmering living wood and the gateway core. Yeah, and we even left a space for it down here. So the gateway core goes in the middle. Should be something like this to form the portal. The two pylons we have to put up front on top of mana pools. 
And then we right click with the wand of the forest, assuming we have enough mana in these pools. And I'm not sure exactly how much it is. Well, very insightful, Lexa Gavitania. Would cost a huge amount of mana. <laughs> how much is a huge amount? The thing is, if we try this and we don't have enough, it's going to void the mana that we have. Eh, let's go for it. Okay, does it stay open? We got the achievement. I think it might have worked. First thing we do is trade the book. It's going to give us the upgraded version. And now apparently we have the knowledge of Alphomancy, or the knowledge of the elves. However, all we realistically need is actually just a dragon stone. We can throw through a mana pearl. Not a dragon stone, pixie dust. <laughs> and then from here for the Spectrolis is just a bunch of runes. We do need to get some cake somehow. Oh, and some snow. I don't know how we're going to get that. Maybe through the Twilight Forest. So the plan is to use integrated dynamics to make this happen. We've got a bit more farming and setup to do for this. So I'm going to do a bunch of grinding here. And we'll be back, hopefully, to fix all of our mana issues. Oh, this is really starting to come together here. So we have a brand new addition to our base. Just opposite Batania, we've got this DML room. I'm always going to call it DML, even though it's hostile neural networks. So we got space here for 28 simulation chambers. We saw these last episode. This is what's going to run our sheep data models. This is actually crazy. I didn't know this thing goes up to 99.5% accuracy. That is insane. Last time I played with this, I think the cap was like 30%. This is nuts. This has given us so, so much of this uh, sheep prediction here. And the sheep prediction, of course, we can loot fabricate into white wool. One of the things we need to be able to supply to these simulation chambers is prediction matrix. So I wanted to make sure that we could have that on passive and have our base automatically produce it. So we've got this on the end of the room. Very simple setup here. We've got some crushers, crushing cobble to gravel, gravel to sand, sand into glass with this smeller. We buffer the glass and the glass panes. Again, going back to the principle of building in buffers. We've got a storage bus on the storage controller to our main network, so our main net can read the excess glass that we get from this. Still yet to upgrade the machines, I've just got energy in there, I think, for now. But around the back, we also have another interface from our main net which is supplying iron, lapis, and gold, which we're getting from our sieve setups. Again, we need to buff our sieve setups, and in, technically we're not getting gold ingots, we're just getting gold pieces. So we have to set up ore processing at some point. But yeah, th those are also pumped into the crafter, crafted together with the glass panes, and we get prediction matrix, which is buffered in this drawer down here. I've got it limited to one stack. We don't need to buffer too much of this. I don't want to use too much gold right now. But then behind the simulation chambers, for now we just have the one hooked up with the sheep sim in there. Sheep Simulator. <laughs> Although the reason I, want, I built so many of these things is to be able to easily expand in the future. We can just add data models and be able to pump in the prediction matrix, which comes from our main net interface. Because it's got a storage bus on there, it can read the contents and supply it in the interface here. Anyways, once we get a successful simulation, both of those are sent into a separate interface. This is what's going to be the subnet here. So we're going to store everything in drives. So we got to do some basic subnet wiring here. This is our main controller. We got a P2P connection right on the end here, which supplies both of the interfaces, the storage bus and the extra interface for prediction. And then here we want to quartz fiber so that we, of course, we send the power, but not the channels. Everything on Cyan is going to belong to hostile neural networks. So we got three sets of drive bays here and a terminal in the front. Inside drive number one, we've got a 64k storage cell. This is what's going to hold our generalized overworld prediction. And I found out that we can actually use a destruction card. Yeah, this thing, an overflow destruction card. I think it's like a void upgrade for a drawer. It's going to void any excess of this thing. Meaning that this sheep simulator shouldn't... <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm meaning that this thing should never stop unless we have the buffer filled on prediction for sheep. In which case that's fine because that also means we're filled on wool. So yeah, the overworlding matter will go here. The sheep prediction we're going to give its own four or 16k item storage cell. Last thing to do is hook up the interface on the output of our simulation chambers. 
So again, this is on Cyan, this is our subnet. We want to make sure that we dodge this main dense cable so we can place anchors above. Oh yeah, we do also need an ME controller. We're going to have above eight devices. Then we can just connect all the Cyan cables together. And we'll need one more on the other side for the opposite interface. I have the setups mirrored on both sides, just for when we eventually expand. But yeah, whenever we open the Cyan terminal, we should see our predictions. Perfection. Now we need to get these into a loot fabricator to give us white wool. We got loot fabricators here and we have a extra interface here, which is going to belong to the subnet. So this also needs a Cyan cable as it's pulling from the drives, the storage on the drives here. I think we'll probably just go straight across with this one. Again, keep the cables nice and straight here. Yeah, so here we want to request sheep prediction. We can extract from the universal pipe. Although, you know what? Whenever we add more of these things, I think we're going to have to switch to XNet because we can't filter the inserts with pipes here. For now, though, we can make it work. We also need to give this thing power. Oh, yeah, I forgot this thing has a huge internal buffer. Select the wool and we're making white wool. We need to also store this in our drives. We can also name our storage drives here. This one is specifically for white wool. And of course, partition in the cell workbench to only allow white wool inside. I'm going to also name the sheep prediction one. And the generalized, that's the American spelling, generalized <laughs> overworldian matter. Overworld prediction it's now called. I'm stuck in 1.12. Yeah, then we can just extract from the bottom and go back into the cyan interface with a pipe upgrade. Yeah, so now we can see our wool in the subnet, but we need to make sure that we can expose this to the main network. As over here, wherever we craft wool, this is pulling from our main network, these interfaces back here. So to read contents from subnets, you have to place an interface first. Yeah, interface here, which connects to the Cyan network. Storage bus on that. This we want on extract only though, and high priority. And this we connect up to our main network line here, like so. So what that does is now it should allow us to see the white wool and the predictions, everything inside the drives there basically which we now do, including the prediction matrix that we're crafting in the external storage on the subnet. Are you following along yet? <laughs> Are you lost yet? I hope I still have you guys here. We're almost there though, we're almost there. I think we're done with hostile neural networks. During the time lapse, I was also able to craft the Spectrolus. I also did prepare a bunch of material. As I mentioned, we're gonna be using integrated dynamics. There is one more thing that we need though, and that is the omnidirectional connector. I really hope it exists in this version still. It does. Okay, yeah, let's get a recipe for this thing. It looks like we're about half full on the pattern provider capacity that we have. It's almost about time that we upgrade those things. Okay, this is future three talking. The next couple of minutes get very, very in depth. I'm going to leave a timestamp if you want to skip it. That's totally fair enough. <laughs> okay, so just a recap on the Spectrolus so that we know what we're working with here. So the Spectrolus will request different types of wool starting at white, and it's going to ask for them in this very specific order right here. I think it's the order that it appears in the creative inventory. Whenever we drop it a white wool, it's going to generate a small amount of mana, as we can see. Then it requests orange, the next color in sequence. Generates some more mana. If we give it the wrong type of wool, if we drop white again, it destroys it instantly, but it does not generate any extra mana. Once it gets to the end of the sequence at black wool, it then repeats to white and will keep generating mana so long as you throw it the right type of wool. So how do we make sure that we can supply it the right type of wool? We are going to use Integrate Dynamics NBT reading. I'm a tiny bit rusty when it comes to this stuff. But what we want here is a block reader. Just for testing purposes, I'm also going to add a display panel, a screen. So now what this allows us to do, this block reader, we can grab the tile NBT data. If we put this inside the screen, it's going to show us all the NBT data listed out here. And you can see on the very top here, it says next color zero. Zero refers to white wool. Zero is basically the first item in the list that it searches for. As we can see, it does want white wool to be dropped next to it to generate mana. So given that we know this data, actually, let's just leave that in there for now. We'll take a separate one. We have to isolate this next color variable and then send that data to a world item exporter. This is what will actually drop the wheel itself. One more thing we'll need is a variable store and we have to connect this to the same network. So now we need to grab one of each type of wheel. Try to keep them in order here. The first thing that we want to do inside our logic programmer is to make a list. This is effectively how we'll decode the numbers and assign them to the various types of wheel. So we want this to be in order on item mode and zero is going to be white wheel. One is going to be orange, then magenta, light blue, etc. all the way down the list. So we should have 15 in the list since it starts at zero. And of course there's 16 different colors. 15th is black. We can create a variable here and that will give us a list. Slight side note, but we do need a chicken feather. This can allow us to craft the labeler. That way we can rename the variable cards when we make them. So next variable card we want is a string. And this is going to be next color, exactly as it's written on the NDT data. 
So again, we make another variable card and we can rename this. I'm going to name it next color. This corresponds to the text on the top here. Then we want to get the integer from that. Right now we're reading all of the NBT. We need to isolate that to only the integer of the string next color. So to do that, we can put the variable that we grabbed from the block reader under this NBT get integer. And then we put in the string. That is going to give us the integer value, or in other words, the will that we need to drop. So I'm going to call this one next color int. Okay, so we're done with all the will. Next thing we want to do is assign this integer value to a color of will. So this time we want just a regular list get. We want the list in the first slot and next color int in the second slot. I'm going to call this next color item. So now if we put all of those variables in the variable store and next color item goes in place item entity in the world item exporter. It's a very long name. So I hope, uh, hope this is easy enough to follow. We also want to make sure this can only transport one piece of will at a time, as obviously if we give it the wrong type of will, it gets destroyed. So if we put this in here, it's going to request white will and try to drop it. But of course, we have to connect it to our drawer network, right? So this is where the omnidirectional connectors come in. I believe we have to link these in a shapeless craft. So they belong to group 67. One of these we want to put on this side next to the spectrolus. The other side we want to put next to the storage controller, next to all of our will. And what this basically does is it transfers the signal wirelessly. We want a regular interface on this storage controller and just link it up with some logic cable. So it's effectively like we're plugging it in. Oh, and it's already started. Look at this. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's working. We're making mana. However, it is being quite wasteful. As you can see, the Spectralis is full and it's still dropping it, which means we are wasting mana right now. On the display panel, we can also see that there's a mana value, which should make it quite easy to turn this off. We just have to isolate the mana NBT data and then also send that to the item exporter if it's above a certain amount. And to do that, we want to create a new item variable. This can be anything. I'm just going to use gray concrete. Just something that the drawer network here of Will does not have access to, so therefore it cannot send to the exporter. We also have to create a string for mana. Mana, no caps, no spaces. We want to grab the tile entity MBT. And again, we want to do the NBT get integer, sim similar to what we've done with next color. So it's tile NBT and the string mana. I'm going to call this one mana int. We're done with this tile NBT. We're done with the string of mana. Then we need one more integer value of zero. And then we want equals if the mana is equal to mana int is equal to zero. Give us another variable. I'm going to call this mana equals zero. We're now done with mana int. We're done with the integer of zero. Last thing we want to do is a choice. So a choice will basically, if a boolean, true or false, if boolean is true, then it takes the first value. If not, then it takes the second. So if mana equals zero, we want it to choose the next color item. This is the one we put in the exporter originally. And if the mana does not equal zero, then we want it to export gray concrete, which it will never actually be able to do. Therefore, it will stop dropping items. This one we keep. The rest we can toss in the variable store. And now when we put this in the exporter, it's going to drop only if the Spectralis has space for mana. Oh my goodness, that took a while to get through. <laughs> it's working though. Oh my goodness, it's working. Yep, and we can see on our display here that the mana waits until it's at zero before it drops again. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. That was a very long segment, but I felt like it was a, it was necessary to explain what was going on here. And welcome to all of you who have just skipped. We have a working Spectralis. <laughs>Yeah, so I have been doing some cleaning up around here. I removed the endo flames and whatnot. I also added in this little screen back here to tell us which color it's on. And yeah, I noticed that we were still having troubles with white wool generation. It looks like it's more or less caught up now. And to try and remedy that, I have increased the simulations that we're running, the sheep simulators. <laughs> so I think we have four now running sheep. Yeah, these have still got a little while to level up. But once they do, I guess we can make a judgment on whether it's sufficient or not. Anyways, we have been doing a lot of Batania. I think we're going to put Batania on the back burner for now. There's still some things we have to do, like the runic altar. We have to automate the, the runes themselves. And there's one or two bits and pieces that we need for these final runes for the ATM star. However, we have some other issues to tackle, which I would like to get started on today. I don't think it's something we'll finish off. There is actually one upgrade in Batania I would like to make. I forgot about this. We need a rune of water. No, rune of air. Rune of earth. Rune of summer. And rune of pride. The first tier three rune I think we've made. Oh, I can't even, I can't get over how cool this thing is. <laughs> 
yeah, I want to make the Ring of Far Reach, which does exactly what it says in the tin. One more Elementium. Gives us an extra 3.5 blocks of reach distance. Yeah, pretty awesome, right? We can reach, like, back here to this block. That's cool. Industrial Forgoing. In fact, there's a whole chapter on it on the quest book. A lot of you guys are going to be familiar with this mod. It can do basically everything. And today we're going to start through its progression. There is a lot of cool stuff we can do with Industrial Forgoing, with the ultimate goal of being able to generate power of it. 25 million RF per tick of it, to be precise. In fact, I think it's more than that. But we have to start somewhere, right? We have to start with the Pity Machine Frame. Easy enough recipe, we'll get Applied Energistics to auto-craft it for us. We'll make like 12 to start with. No, we won't. We're missing the redstone recipe. All right, easy first quest. What's next? The fluid extractor. We can also do that. Easy. Next is <laughs> is latex. Latex, I believe we can get from trees. Wait a second. There's a different. There's a different latex. Hmm. The arboreal extractor. I wonder which one's best. Actually, I assume ultimately where we're going with this is to get rubber for plastic. Yeah. To do that, it does look like we need at least some latex. So I think what we do is we have to naturally grow a tree. Actually, maybe with industrial foregoing, it doesn't need to be natural. I think the arboreal extractors have to be natural, though. Optionally, I think we can give this power to speed it up. And yeah, we're getting a tiny amount of latex in the bottom. I bet there's some upgrades we can add to this. I want to try to judge how fast this is, because we want to set up a whole system to automatically collect that for us. Alrighty, so I've done a bit of testing in a creative world with both the arboreal extractor and these things. And definitely with upgrades, these are much faster. So I think at least to start, we're gonna have three setups with four extractors each. We should just double check at this stage, we can actually place them and they don't have to be naturally grown. It looks like that is the case. We are getting latex. So there's actually two things we want to do with latex. The first is to turn it into plastic as the quest suggested. So to do that, we can use some universal pipe to extract the latex from the bottom. I believe we can extract from the bottom anyway. And we'll do that on all 12. Those pipes are all going to join together and go into an ender tank, which we're going to place here. We'll use triple light grey, I think, for this. And I'm stuck. Oh yeah, and make sure to set the extraction. Oh, wait a second, we're not going to be able to power these, are we? Oh, dang it, I keep forgetting that you can't input from the output side on these on these universal pipes. Ah, that either means we need to do this on each corner, or we have to switch to something like Xnet again. <laughs> I use Xnet for everything. Or, hold on, there's the lasers mod, right? Yeah, this could be the perfect use case for lasers. Let's, let me sort out the inventory though, it's a bit of a mess. Oh wait a sec, does lasers transport power? There is an energy card, I assume it's this. Let's get a recipe. Oh, and I had plenty of you guys suggest the card holder. Oh, don't use ender chests. Which I'm guessing just allows you to hold the item cards and have them stack. Which appears to be the case, perfect. Yeah, so we want a laser node on each fluid extractor. And I'm assuming an energy card in the top face of the laser node. Then we want our fluid cards in each one on extract. I'm hoping it's possible to configure them all at once in this card holder. Oh yeah, it does. Awesome. Yeah, so all the extract fluid cards on the top face as well. Yeah, then we want to have a flux point to supply the power. We can do that to this laser node here. We'll select our reactor power. And in this one, we want to have energy extract. Yeah, extract energy. And we want that on the bottom face, so down. And then also in this one, I've got an ender tank connected. So we also want our fluid extract on this face here. Then I think, assuming all these are in range, we can just connect this laser node up to all of these ones here. Oops. I think it's just right click. Yeah, right click all of these. It's not extracting latex. We've got power though. Oh, right. Of course, these have to be on insert. Yeah, we want to insert latex this way. There we go. Yeah, that ended up so much cleaner than it would have been. <laughs> wow, I love these things. No hidden wires, although we do have some, like tiny bits of laser here. Nothing a few framed blocks can't fix. So the other side of the ender tank, I've got this line of machines set up here. We want to send it into our latex processing unit, and this along with some water, which we're getting from a sink over here. This time we will use the universal pipe. We can go from the ender tank. No, we don't want. <laughs> oh no, we don't want this filled with water. I think I just made a mess on the triple white channel. Yep, I'm gonna have to trash that later. For now, we can just change it to triple grey. That should be our latex channel. Then set the extract. Yeah, so latex plus water equals tiny dry rubber. Tiny dry rubber has to be compressed in the crafting table into regular dry rubber. So we've got a sequential fabricator below. I want to test if this thing can automatically pull the inputs. I think all we have to do here is set the recipe. This is just another powered crafting table, basically. And... Oh, it does! Nice! Once it has nine, it should craft the dry rubber, which it does. That goes down to a powered furnace or an energized smelter from Mechanism. This should also be insert the top, extract the bottom, and that gives us our plastic. 
Awesome. I, we should have an AE connection under here. It's close, and we can put a storage bus on the drawer. High priority. We definitely don't want to void upgrade this one. We can energy upgrade the mechanism smelter though. We do want to lock the drawer and actually plug it in. All right, so that was the first use for latex. I mentioned there was a second, and that is in the dissolution chamber. We can make various lenses to make the, the drill from industrial for going, and we can also make our upgrades this way. There should be a speed upgrade here somewhere. Yeah, the speed upgrades. This has definitely changed from 1.12. In fact, I'm not even sure the dissolution chamber existed in that version. But yeah, we need latex and a bunch of material to get our speed upgrades to increase the speed of these things. So what we're going to do for now is we're just going to have a buffer tank here. And I think in the next episode, we're going to start working on machine processing and automation. Yeah, that's going to slowly, slowly fill up. I guess the last thing is we need a way to place the logs. As you can see here, they do eventually break once all the latex is extracted. So we need some way to replace these things. And I think the solution for this is a block placer, which does take plastic. Oh yeah, and I was just watching back the footage. I realized that we do have a void upgrade in here for some reason. I think this was a reused drawer. Yeah, we don't, we definitely do not want to keep that in there. I'm glad I spotted that. And I also missed an extra pipe on the back here to power the smelter. So I guess while we wait on the plastic, we can also implement a applied energistics interface here. One really cool thing about AE is you can actually pass channels through devices like this. You don't have to have the cable wrap around. It does, of course, consume one channel though. So as you can see, we now have two channels in use. One is the storage bus down there. And one, of course, is the interface. In the interface, we want to request the oak logs. We'll set the stock amount to 64. Yeah, then we can just have a row of item pipes, which go all the way across. We can disconnect from these laser nodes here on both sides. I think maybe we just hit 12 plastic, which means we can get three block placers and a quest complete. And these things should just place any blocks in front of them, so long as they have space and power. We'll need some energy cards in at least one of these faces and extract from the interface here. And so now when we take this away, you should place another. Nice. Clean. <laughs> I like it. All right. So we're making plastic and latex at a very, very poor rate right now. We need some upgrades. But again, that's something for next episode. The ultimate goal here is to go for the mycelial reactor, which is similar to a rainbow generator from uh, XU2. I think that's probably going to be the most interesting and fun way to generate power. Spamming solars or a massive, well, maybe a massive reactor could be fun. I think we have to do that anyway for the ATM star. Anyways, that is going to wrap us up today. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time for some more ATM7 to the sky.